The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual co-host and do not reflect the official policy or position of the Firearms Radio Network and or their employers. Viewer discretion is advised. This is especially true on our live shows. Broadcast for shooters, hunters, and gun enthusiasts, this is the Firearms Radio Network. The bandwidth for this episode of This Week in Guns is sponsored by Patriot Patch Company. PatriotPatch.co Welcome to This Week in Guns. This show is brought to you by the Firearms Radio Network and Patriot Patch Company. And this show offers commentary on the latest firearms industry news, information, and buzz. I'm your host, Kenny Ortega. Don't forget, if you're shopping at Amazon, go ahead and visit our link at uh, firearmsradio.tv slash Amazon. Any purchases that you make there will go ahead and help us support the show. And uh, with that being said, let's jump right into it. Back with us after a much long overdue hiatus, we've got Ebbs. From the media side to the retail side of firearms, Ebbs is breathing new life into an old platform, The Single Shot. The co-founder of his family business, House of Arms, specializing solely in the Thompson Center uh, Encore and contender platforms of rifles and pistols. Welcome welcome back, Ebbs. It's been a long time. It's good to be back, man. Thank you very much. And then also back with us, we've got Mark from Fit and Fire, an Army veteran, now YouTuber, looking to combine guns, gear, personal defense, and fitness to promote a free and active lifestyle. Mark, great to have you back. Yeah, hey, thanks. Hi, Mom. <laughs> I'm sure she says hi back. <laughs> good deal. All right. Well, let's jump right into it. So, um, some breaking news in the last couple of days here. We've got the Ninth Circuit affirms that open carry is a constitutional right. Now, while many of us already know that, I think the most surprising part of this is the fact that it came out of the Ninth Circuit. Ev, you got thoughts on that? Yeah, surprise. Uh, probably most of us wasn't even on our radar to know that they were talking about it, right? Um, so you see celebration go everywhere, social media, everything blows up. And, and, uh, I think it just confirms that it's still, you know, the validity of the argument. Uh, we feel like logic is on our side, uh, that it's a right, not a privilege. Um, but, you know, still in early stages of the argument for, for everybody across the board, um, outside of those that would run, you know, tightly within the firearm circle. So, uh, Definitely a definitely a uh, step forward, but uh, I'm just super cautious as to wondering, is there some sort of additional definition that's going to come beyond that uh, where they clarify it even more and and uh, uh, try to shackle it up or say, well, but now we've said this, so let's add to it. Um, so I just because of where it came from, I'm just kind of just uh, waited on bated breath for what's going to happen next, if anything. Yeah, no doubt. Mark? So this comes from the Ninth Circuit, which is one of the uh, circuits that has the most overturned rulings of any circuit court system uh, in the United States. The thing that I'm concerned about the most with this is the fact that it only discusses open carry. It doesn't say anything about concealed carry. Um, in fact, there's actually a ruling from California that uh, says that concealed carry is not a part of the Second Amendment. So it, it, it's it seems to me that the left hand and the right hand aren't talking to each other and interested to see how this will proceed in the next months to years uh, coming forward. So we'll see. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, considering the fact that uh, the Peruta case was very similar, where you know we had a favorable judgment, and then it was uh, when it went to an en banc panel, um, it was overturned. Hopefully, this doesn't uh, follow suit, uh, but it is definitely something we need to keep an eye on and see where it goes from here. Well, I think some, one of the dangerous things that often pops up with situations like this is we'll see it, and then we get excited, and then we let our guard down, and stop emphasizing the need to educate and push forward and and it's hard because you're constantly under fire and you want to take a deep breath and you want to take a break but um i I don't it it confirms that they're talking about it i don't know that it necessarily confirms that we've really won anything yet yeah absolutely correct i mean we just got to see where it goes from here um and like i said hopefully it doesn't uh go the way that pruda did so we'll keep our fingers crossed indeed. Moving on, 
Um, I don't know if you guys saw the video on this one, but there was a Georgia waitress that uh, a guy on his way out of the restaurant decides to uh, grab her backside and she puts a hurting on him. <laughs> Choke slam, right? Yeah, indeed. She made him cry for mama. Mark, did you see that one? Uh, I didn't see the video. I see the thumbnail right here. And, you know, I just say good on them. You know, if you're going to act a fool, you're going to, you know, as they always say, uh, play stupid games, get su- stupid prizes. And I'm sure he was completely surprised at uh, what was coming his way. <laughs> oh, absolutely. She turns around, she grabs him, you know, in a uh, somewhat of a chokehold and then uh, pulls him back and tosses him into the table behind her. And uh, he ended up getting arrested for sexual battery. So um, he's probably going to end up having to register as a sex offender. All because he decided to grab a piece of tail. I mean, it's just stupid. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Now he's got something that's going to follow him for life. Yep, just saw the video right here. It's pretty <laughs> epic. Yeah, and it, he wasn't he wasn't subtle about it either. No, not at all. No, it, it says. Uh, I, I like the, the article says, and this is this is uh, uh, an MSN share from the New York Times, but. Uh, it's only a 21 year old woman, and as she does it, she screams at him, "You don't touch me!" Uh, which, I mean, you know, to add some add some emphasis to uh, to the action was <laughs> pretty sweet. It's the kind of thing you see in a movie, and you're like, "Well, that can never happen in real life." But uh, she definitely used the element of surprise after he thought he was just going to behave like he did and turned it around on him. Oh, indeed, 115 pound woman. She put the hurt on. Yeah. And and this is good, too, because, you know, I've got a daughter and, you you know, I've both my wife and I are really pushing the idea for her that, uh, you know, you are capable of defending yourself. You are capable of taking care of yourself. And we're going to teach you and show you how to do that. You don't need anyone else to do it for you. You can do it for yourself. Uh, If you if you decide that you want to have a partner in your life to help take care of you. By all means, but you do not have to have anything. You have it yours. You you can handle yourself, and this is a great example of it too. Oh, most definitely. I've got two daughters also, and uh, I mean, if anyone, have, well, my oldest just had a situation like that. I had to tell her what to do because I'm not in California to take care of it myself. So I just had to guide her. <laughs> so yeah, it's just you know, when men behave badly, these are the things that that happen. So um, thankfully, uh, he's getting his. So, all right, moving on. Did you guys happen to see this uh, video on the uh, shootout in um, in Houston with a bunch of teenagers? Yeah, a seventeen year old, a thirteen year old, and a fifteen year old. It says, yeah, it's pretty pretty discouraging. Yeah, indeed. I mean, it was it was just crazy. But uh, I mean, the amount of gunfire that took place um, was insane. So, uh, why don't you guys discuss that for a minute? I guess I'm having some mic issues. Uh, I'm going to step out for a second. <laughs> yeah, it says 10 to 11 deputies. Uh, I assume that's a super early statement because you'd kind of hope to know just how many were involved in it. Um, but 10 to 11 deputies uh, and one ISD police officer fired their weapons, but no officers were injured. Which is which is something that I'm really uh, happy to see. I mean, I, I hate to see any type of uh, violent altercation amongst anyone, you know, naturally, if there's a case for it, then by all means, we need to, we need to ensure that law enforcement has the ability and the means to squash something that goes sideways really quick. But uh, to, to be able to see that uh, law enforcement uh, came out of it fairly unscathed was nice, but you know, where in the world are these uh, teenagers uh, getting their hands on on weapons like this is just mind boggling to me, and I know that evil is going to prevail if it wants to, regardless. But it just, I, I'm just left shaking my head, like, really? So, well, yeah, and you know, we we've, we've seen you don't see instances like this as often as you do, uh, and and right, all of it's unfortunate. You don't want to like you don't want to see the deputy shot, and you don't want to see the kids either uh but you you don't just expect somebody to be a sitting duck regardless of how old the the shooter is but it's it's rare to see it like this as opposed to uh you know an accidental use of a firearm inside of the home going poorly um you know parents leave guns either out or easily accessible um hard to say especially with 
13 year old, like I, we were just talking about our kids. I have a daughter who's 12 and, um, that's all, man, that's awful close. And it's just awful young. Cause I, I mean, I know how proud I am of my kid, but, uh, she's not ready for that. Right. Um, yeah. And, and, and the idea that, uh, that these three individuals and, and I, I don't want to pass judgment. I don't want to, I don't want to, um, be, uh, you know, say anything stereotypical, but you, I, I would, I would imagine that the propensity of violence comes from a cultural aspect, uh, regardless if it was, if the individual was, was, uh, you know, if the individuals, I should say, were white, black, Mexican, you know, um, Asian, it doesn't matter. That piece of it doesn't matter. The race element doesn't matter. The part that I'm concerned about is the culture, you know, uh, is, is there, is there a father in the household? Is the parents taking care of the kids? Um, I mean, the, the, the indications would be no because they got firearms and they were very brazen in their, their use of them. But it just, again, it just leaves me shaking my head wondering what the heck is going on. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Up. Oh, Hey, welcome back, Kenny. <laughs> yeah. I guess people are saying on YouTube, they can, they can hardly hear me. So I'm trying You're, to you are kind of quiet on my end too. Same here. All right, not sure why, but I'll see if I can figure it out as we go along. But uh, yeah, undoubtedly they you know stole these uh, these guns and you know or they purchased them stolen um, because obviously they're too young to get them themselves. So you know, no amount of gun control laws are going to go ahead and fix that when they're committing a crime to get the gun in the first place. Exactly. Mm, yeah. Exactly. So. All right. So. Next story, let's move on to California here. It looks like the Firearms Policy Coalition says that only 3% of California gun owners registered their assault weapons. So here the <laughs> giant push to, to do my, it. This is, my favorite, uh, this is my favorite link in all the notes. Exactly. Same here. Yeah, I just wonder where the disobedience is going to get them. What are your thoughts on it? I mean, I, I would say that it's it's... I don't want to. I don't want to be doom and gloom, and I don't want to be uh, off on one one complete extreme here. But you know, California is going to put themselves real quick in a situation that uh, could lead to, dare I say, some some type of uh, you know micro civil war. You know, I mean, do you really think that law enforcement officers are going to go door to door and kick down doors and start? Uh, arresting individuals because they didn't register their firearms. No, it's not. Uh, I'm sure they'll find loopholes to uh, indict these individuals, but it's no big surprise. I mean, this is this is if if anything, this is um, this is oh wow, what's the term that uh, MLK always used? Um, basically, silent protest. I guess you know. Um, so. Uh, good on them. I mean, I'm not saying to break the law. I'm not saying to do anything like that. But you know what? Good on you. Yeah, I mean, they don't. They don't have to listen to us. We can. I'm in Colorado. You know, we had the magazine thing five years ago now, and it's been. Uh, the you know even that they're getting around gun shops now have like you could go buy a kit. Right, they'll disassemble it, repackage it, and you can buy a kit. So your 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 civil disobedience uh, can happen in different ways. You know, this is this is serious in terms of the indictment, like you said, Mark. Uh, but at the same time, you got to wonder how do the other American people who would be shouldered with the follow through actually do it, if at all. Um, remember the, the Connecticut registration a few years back, uh, where has that gone? Uh, as far as I know, nowhere. Um, and I think they were at like 2% or something, or, I mean, it was some ridiculous minuscule single digit number that, uh, once, once you read the figures, you know, what they'd estimated, how many people had the type of gun that they felt like needed to be registered, they were just like, well, I'll just say I don't have it anymore. You know, you didn't you didn't outlaw private sales, and I didn't have to keep a record of it. So, uh, I, I've seen so many California residents talking about uh, 
I don't. I, it was a fishing trip, and I lost them. I lost. Yep. Them. They're in the bottom of the lake. Like, and and if somebody, <laughs> I I would love, I would love for somebody to actually go and just take a a beater, you know, high point or or a uh, like a double star AR or you know <laughs> just something that they picked up a, a couple years ago for four hundred bucks or whatever, and then and actually drop it and actually drop it into the bottom of the lake. And at some point, for it even just to accidentally be found, <laughs> for some politician or or somebody to go, oh well, it looks like that actually does happen, and and so you know all it, all it takes is one, and then it makes the news, and everybody's like, oh wow, they you know they really they must have just lost them. Uh, I remember the story that we did on Twig. I know it's probably been a couple, maybe three years ago. There was a guy. Uh, who was found dead in his car in California, and then back at his house, they recovered something ridiculous like 1,200 guns and, and half a million rounds of ammo and all this stuff. And it was it was nothing exciting. He had, you know, he had the uh, like the Remington 710s with the the Bushnell that came with them, like still in the box and just stacks of them side by side is some really crappy surplus guns and nothing that anybody's looking for, but he had so much and and ever, he didn't obtain any of it illegally. Hmm. It was, it was all, uh, you know, completely bought and he just had it right. He stockpiled it. It's like, if anybody says, how many guns do you have? You just say, I, I, I don't really count. Uh, I've got them. They're in a safe. Like they're they're accounted for. Like whatever. I'm not going to give you a number. But did that happen to that guy, or was he just every time every time Academy had a $250 bolt gun with a uh, an optic attached, bore sighted, you know, for sale? He was going to add that to his prepper closet. But he hadn't done anything wrong. But just the fact that they found it all just completely instantly vilified him as a psychopath. Now maybe he was like he was dead and rotting in his car for like up to a week. They thought maybe once they found it, it was so gross uh, and just such a weird story. Um, but for any of them out there now, uh, it, it, that's, that's the thing. So if, if you, if you have stuff stashed, if you refuse to comply, good for you, you know, I'll clap. I'm super proud. It's ironic that it's three percent, like a three per thing, maybe a little bit that actually registered. Uh, but but seriously though, if you've got them, like if you've got them and you're tight lipped about it, you're like, oh yeah, I did lose them. Make sure they're in a good spot because it just takes some ridiculous reason for somebody to need to go through your house or for your kid to say something to a to a doctor or a teacher or you know anything like that. Um, that, like just don't be careless i guess is is my that whole that whole uh roundabout diatribe to get back to saying um if if you if you've got your fist up you know your your uh wolverine's stance whatever just just be be cautious and be smart about it about the whole thing yeah, here, here. I mean, the whole situation is foobar to begin with. I mean, just what is it? Two months ago, thereabouts, an individual was arrested and has been charged with something like twelve felonies because he attempted to actually register his his firearms and was following all the different processes that you're supposed to ahead of time, and then he gets charged. And I was like, that is completely ridiculous. He's trying to follow the rules. He's trying to find do the right thing and then he gets he gets hammered for it you know it's just the whole thing is just ridiculous and completely messed up from the floor up yeah that's one of the things that the story talked about is the fact that uh you know that may have uh, prevented a lot of people from registering the fact that that happened this guy was a uh, like an executive for he sold potatoes to like frito lay or something sorry guys and, sorry uh, about that that's all me no worries <laughs> and then uh you know, so you've got that. You've got a couple of the fact that California has registration, so they know who bought these things. Uh, private party sales have been legal in California since, I believe, 92. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's not like they can say, oh, well, I sold it and I don't know who, who it went to because it's a felony if you did that through, without going through a dealer. So that's admitting to a felony if you did it. Um, and as far as uh, the story you were talking about, as if it's the one I remember, um, the guy also had a bunch of ammo buried on his property, and they actually shut down the 15 freeway so that they could go ahead and uh, – and detonated to make sure that there wasn't anything um, that could cause dam- you know, some damage in the future, something explosive. Wow, I don't, I didn't, I didn't know that second part to it. That's hysterical. 
Yeah, well, I lived in the area, so I remember that the 15 was shut down that <laughs> <laughs> because of that. So uh, uh, I knew about it for that reason. Um, but, you know, all these things being said, you know, ev- these people can never take them out and shoot them. Even if they try to go to BL- BLM land, if the Rangers uh, catch them with something that's not registered, they're going to jail. So, you know, it, it's civil disobedience, but it's only up to a point. It's like, okay, so now you've got a paperweight that you can't use unless it's, you know, an SHTF situation where everything well, goes to hell in a handbasket. Yeah, and what do you, I mean, what, what are your other options? Like, depending on where you're located, can you go, can you go across straight state lines and, and get a small storage unit and, and, you know, even haul a safe and put it safe in the storage unit? And then, like, don't forget to pay for it. But, uh, you know, if you have a means to be able to do that, or there's, there's, there's creative ways mm-hmm. to work around it if you insist on staying in the state. Um, and, and, and I, I know that's, I know that's hard. We used to say, um, you know, before, like before across the board, maybe, maybe the past eight or nine years, like the New York stuff, the magazine stuff, the Connecticut stuff, the Massachusetts stuff, Colorado thought they were untouchable, right? That's supposed to be the wild west out here. And, and then all of a sudden, boom, just like lightning, the magazine thing hit. And, you, and instead of taking on an attitude of we're all in it together, we would have the attitude of you just need to move out of California. Like quit being an idiot, quit complaining. It's not our problem. Just leave California. If you can absolutely do it. Like I I would still stand beside that and say, do it. But sometimes you don't have the means. Sometimes it's where your family is, your, your kids, like, you know, whatever. It's just, it's not always that cut and dry. Um, And so if there's a way to be creative, like you said, Kenny, there's, there's stuff that all of that, not just the registration from now, their stuff is so far reaching for the past 25, 30 years um, that, that there's still ways if they're going to get you, they're going to get you. And, you know, is it like the IRS? Forget, if you don't pay your taxes for long enough, you know, they're going to go through the paperwork. The pencil pushers are going to come after you. They're eventually going to find you. They're going to find where you live. And just because uh, just because of your descent, or whatever, you know, they're, they're going to find a way to stick it to you either with, with extra or sending you to jail for not paying if you make enough. Absolutely. And that was another thing I forgot to touch on also is that California did have the, uh, the magazine rebuild kits for a while until they put a stop to that. So count on the, on that coming to an end in Colorado soon, if they follow California's, uh, lead. Yeah. We're, we're in the middle of a, a new governor primary, so we'll see. We'll see where we get this time around this fall because uh, it was not favorable last time um, for this segment of the population. And uh, the new options are even scarier and the way the population has continued to grow. Fortunately, Kenny, we do get a lot of Texans. Uh, I think when I'm in downtown Denver, I see more. The more most out-of-state license plates I see are from Texas, interestingly enough. Now, uh, the Californians seem to gravitate towards the uh, – the Boulder and Fort Collins and and uh, different areas like that along the Front Range. So we're we're not safe, but you're right. Yeah, the the rebuild kit ban and I mean, they might even take it take it down more to say, well, you know, 15 was still too much to give them. We got to go to 10 or less. Yeah, it could be. New Jersey just went through it, so hopefully you guys can can escape it. So anyway, that's going to wrap up our positive news segment, and uh, we're going to move into less than positive stuff. Um, and I know this is going to come as a surprise to all, but there was a shooting in Toronto that left two dead, 12 injured. Um, apparently some, uh, you know, Middle Eastern person or person of Middle Eastern descent anyway, went into a restaurant in Toronto and started shooting, um, injured a bunch of people. Gunman uh, was killed as well. So um, probably won't get a whole lot of information from him anymore. Um, now it's just a matter of trying to piece it all together. Um, but, uh, you know, in spite of all the tough gun control laws and everything that they have in Toronto, this still happens. So it just goes to show that gun control doesn't uh, really solve any issues. Um, if anything, it just makes the other people more vulnerable. Um, what are your thoughts on it, um, Mark? So, you know, just a few months ago, we're just a couple of months removed from an individual driving down uh, the, the, the sidewalk and, and running over people uh, and naturally everybody's like well hold on a second we can't blame the car it's obviously the individual uh, yeah. but we you end it, you have a situation where a a gunman right 
goes and kills a whole bunch of people. Uh, it, they didn't say a driver killed a whole bunch of people. It, the point that I'm getting at is evil is going to find a way regardless. Now, I still haven't figured out or heard what type of weapon was used. Um, but even still, Toronto has extremely strict uh, gun laws. Well, Canada altogether has strict gun laws, and, and I'm just surprised that in their infinite wisdom and in their infinite abilities to restrict people's rights across the board, regardless if it's gun rights or sp- freedom of speech, they didn't see this coming. So um, it's unfortunate. I'm very saddened at the fact that people had to lose their lives, but uh, at, at the very least, it's something that's going to point to evil will prevail if you allow it to. Yeah, I, I I would stand up and uh, agree with that a hundred percent. I'd also say to anybody listening, I I think we, we are we're inundated with news like this, which I hate uh, so often. Um, if 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 not more than ever, at least just hearing it as often because of all the different avenues that it can travel, and I think one of the biggest things that we're faced with as a community is the temptation to say, uh, to immediately point a finger to Canada and say, ha, see how strict your, your laws are. See everything that just happened. Um, this is, this is not a gun control issue. It's a people issue, all of which is still true, but the timing of our choice to do that is the same as when we get pissed about, uh, somebody who's anti-gun standing up as soon as a shooting happens here, a mass murder of some sort happens here, and saying, see, these are the type of guns we can't have. This is the stuff that happens because we have firearms like this available, over-the-counter, blah, blah, blah. We, we've heard it We've heard it dozens and dozens of times. And what, I, I think I think when we allow ourselves to behave in, in, in the way where we just say um, – I told you so, then we're no different than, uh, than everyone who, whether it's media, politicians, people that are just anti in general, standing up, pumping their fists and saying, uh, this, this is why we can't have these things. I I think it's, I think it's the same emotion. And I, I think, I think we have to be smarter with our tactics and uh, in our behaviors, just because it's so sensitive already for us that you have to be above reproach and you have to you have to behave in a way uh, that that uh, removes doubt and, and uh, you know, proves the haters or whatever, like whatever uh, terminology we need to go down there. Um, I think there's a temptation. It's super unfortunate uh, that that it had to happen at all. You know, all of them are. Um but man, I surprising, right? You didn't you didn't expect that to be the next one that you hear about because generally, I mean, Canada's pretty vanilla. I mean, it, with God love them, everything. <laughs> Indeed, Mark. Oh, sorry, you're muted. Sorry about that. Yeah. So I guess the biggest thing, and then I completely agree with Ebbs there. The the, the, the angle that I try to take is not a, uh, a point the finger, um, which is extremely easy to do, but uh, in, in fact, kind of pivoting on that discussion and say, this is actually a reason why I would want to have a weapon for myself to be able to protect myself because, you know, what is the response time for Toronto's police department? How long was he able to get in there and uh, rattle off rounds before he was stopped? Uh, I, I did see in the, going back over the news article that it was a handgun, but they didn't specifically say what type of handgun. And even if you put certain restrictions on a semi-automatic handgun, like say the California 10 round limit, that's still 10 rounds that could potentially injure or, or worse to, you know, 10 people. So why not have the ability to protect myself? Why not have that liberty to uh, protect myself in those types of situations? And, you know, uh, I, 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 not to boast, but th- that's one of the reasons why I love living in the state of Kansas is because we do have those laws to allow us to protect our lives and our property. So, yeah, there's been some speculation, uh, some reports that 
don't know if they have any uh, any basis in fact or not. But some people are saying that the uh, weapon was illegally obtained from the United States. Um, and again, that's just conjecture at this point. I have no way to back that up. Um, yep. You know, there's going to be well, all, all good. Of course, they of course they say that. Of course, I mean, just you 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 could almost read the writing on the wall before anybody says it that you know the uh the the gun the gun happy uh cowboys down south uh provided the provided the firearm listen every everything comes from somewhere um you know the reality is that the the origin of where it comes from doesn't make up the mind of the person who uses it uh, to commit their their act. So, uh, but but it's funny you say that because I just you knew it was coming. Uh, it, you, even if even if they prove it, you just you, you know just just one of those things. You you knew it was coming. Oh, absolutely! They got to try everything, and you know, police have declined to state where it came from. So you know that there's going to be more information coming out. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe it'll be another Las Vegas where we don't know anything. So see how it goes. So moving on to another crazy situation. Um, so in Los Angeles, there was a shootout this weekend where um, apparently some guy shot his grandmother like seven times, shot another lady there at the house, dragged her into his grandmother's car, was driving. Um, police en- ended up tracking the car. Uh, got into a pursuit. He shot out the rear window as he was shooting at police. Ended up getting hit in, in I think it's left arm or something. And then ended up in a Trader Joe's over in um, uh, Silver Lake, which from South LA, it's about 30 miles. And in LA traffic, that could be two hours um, or more in some cases. So, but he ended up uh, in a hostage standoff in there. Um, and, uh, you know, ended up getting killed, but uh, in the in the process, there was the store manager, and she was killed. And now it turns out she was killed by an LAPD bullet, um, which was crazy. Um, so, you know, the suspect is dead. Obviously, the grandmother, or I'm sorry, he's not dead. He's in custody. He's uh, one one uh, murder charge. You know, one count of murder that he's charged with, um, as well as you know numerous other crimes, and uh, just an insane situation in what's one of the nicer areas of uh, the Los Angeles uh, city suburbs uh, in Silver Lake. So, Mark, what are your thoughts on this? So, you know, it, it's it's unfortunate. I, I want to praise some of the heroes that uh, uh, were in that situation that helped some of the customers get out of the Trader Joe's. I mean, that that's just uh, intestinal fortitude at its greatest to be under a very stressful situation and then be able to lead individuals to safety, which is pretty cool. And there's a, one of the links that you had in the articles shows that talks about an individual utilizing a rope ladder to get people out of a window and, and, you know, lead them to safety, which is pretty awesome. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm discouraged to hear that, uh, it, there was possible, possibly, uh, of course, you know, they say it's a, a policeman's bullet who killed the manager. It, it's, it's terribly unfortunate. And I'm, and I'm discouraged at listening to the police chiefs, um, comments that says that he believes at first glance that it was justified. Well, <laughs> we don't know the full situation was the gunman using the individual as a hostage or whatever. I don't know. But uh, the, the biggest thing is there was a, a very bad person who held a lot of people hostage. Unfortunately, someone uh, was killed in that situation. Very much hate to see that. I'm sure that she had a very beautiful and, uh, full life ahead of her, but everybody's going to immediately look at the LAPD and say, Hey, look, you guys need to train your officers better. I, it's, I, I know that's what it's going to come out of it. I know that police officers probably going to have uh, a suspension coming while they investigate and, and the entire thing is just a mess. Uh, and it's unfortunate. I, I, I hope that the LAPD is, um, able to come out of this unscathed, but I'm sure social media is going to, uh, hammer them for sure. Oh, absolutely. Ebs. Yeah. Good, good thoughts, man. Uh, definitely highlight the people who were brave in a, a situation that they didn't choose to be in. And, and I would just come in to say for anybody listening, you know, that might have an inkling of thought, you know, towards that officer, what being accountable for that round, uh, nobody feels worse than, than him right now. Uh, 
you know, the, the family and, and, um, those closest to, uh, that manager being the exception. Uh, but this is, this is not the fault, uh, of those who responded. It's, it's the fault of, um, of him who created the situation to begin with. Um, and, and, and just, it's, it's wrong place, wrong time. The most unfortunate circumstance that could have come out of it. And, uh, just, just super crummy all around. So, uh, heart goes out to everybody that's, that's affected by that, um, as a result of it. And, and I hope, I hope, uh, <clears throat> I hope the, the dude gets, uh, convicted for, uh, for her death as well. I mean, that's, that's on him. Absolutely. Yeah. No, absolutely. You know, um, he should be charged because the felony murder rule says that in if you are in the commission of a felony and someone dies, whether by your hand or by the hand of others trying to uh, negate the felony that you're committing, um, you are guilty of their murder as well. So I'm hoping that the uh, district attorney will go ahead and charge him for that. The the, the woman who was killed, her name is Melita Corrado. Um, you know, her family obviously is having a hard time with this. Um, you know, condolences for her family, for their loss and, you know, for what she ultimately had to suffer through to, you know, for this particular person who decided to do this, who was obviously just, uh, you know, a horrible person all the way around. He, uh, you know, just wouldn't, uh, doesn't conform to the, to, to the norms of society, but, uh, definitely, um, kudos go out to Sean Grace, who was the employee. He actually opened up a window, dropped the rope ladder, got the, the attention of a SWAT officer, and told him that uh, he wanted to go down the ladder. SWAT officer gave him the thumbs up, and uh, you know he went ahead and um, you know got a lot of people out of their coworkers and such, and uh, got them to safety um, so that this person couldn't do any harm to them, which was great. So you know, kudos go out to him, and just an unfortunate situation all the way around. I mean, it's just sad, but uh, thankfully it came to an end before anything further happened. So, next story. Um, Kind of a uh, tragedy just seems to to follow this particular family. So there were two Parkland survivors in Florida who uh, their father was killed during a convenience store robbery. I guess they owned a convenience store. He was there, and during the holdup, he was killed. So, you know, the uh, the two kids managed to escape being injured in Parkland, and now their father is killed in a robbery. Thoughts, Ebs? Uh, if it's, you know, I think some of us are uh, probably – as unlucky as others who are very lucky and uh man that's just that's super close to uh super close to those kids and um i hope they have an environment around them they're both in high school 17 and 15 these kids are um but they they uh yeah i i almost just speechless i mean it's 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 uh it's sad stuff oh definitely i mean it's just you know you just escape a tragedy and here you face another one mark the the problem that i have with this story um and and i'm going to sound extremely uh insensitive but at, at what level do you get to victimhood status squared you know because this individual wasn't an individual who um uh he, he's not, he's not an individual that was killed uh, because of an armed robbery gone wrong. He is a individual that was killed because of an armed robbery gone wrong, who is the father of two children that survived the shooting at uh, Parkland. Right. And okay, that's fine. But let's, let's look at it this way. And this is the thing that popped in my head here. And this is again, extremely insensitive, but um, my sister was killed in a, uh, I should say, let me clarify. My sister-in-law was killed in a, um, um, a mass shooting. And uh, does that make me a survivor or does it make me a survivor that uh, uh, I uh, was in New York when the two towers fell you know, at what level does it make you a survivor just because you were near something that happened? You know, I, I, I don't like the idea that they conflated these two things to 
push an agenda that gun violence has uh, has found their way to this family uh uh, you know, two two separate times. If, if we're counting the number of gun, number of times that gun violence has found me or my family, um, then, uh, then then I, I would trump both of those because of my time uh, here in the United States and the in the situations that I've been in the town, the, the cities that I've lived in, the the situations overseas because of combat tours, the fact that my sister in law was killed in a uh, mass shooting. I mean, let, let's let's really deflate the the real story here. Yes. His daughters were at the school when the mass shooting went, uh, that happened. That doesn't make, that doesn't make him more or less of a victim from the fact that he got shot by somebody who was trying to commit a felony. You know, I, I, I'd probably jump in to Mark. Uh, it would, it would probably sound less insensitive if you said the, the media's attempt to create victim squared, it's, it's not the the family isn't creating that atmosphere for themselves. Like it's not from what we can tell the family standing up and saying, this has happened. This is un- unfair. We can't believe it's happened again. Um, I mean, it, so you can, we would be probably covering this story, even if the kids hadn't been in the proximity of the, the, the Parkland murders. Um, because this guy, this is a, this is an immigrant who had been in the area for 20 years. He owned his own store. This was this was his store he was working in. And he even, maybe out of self-preservation, um, I don't think there's any video. I actually uh, looked for video. So we, we got some pictures, security footage pictures of uh, the, the guy who's uh, the alleged killer, uh, but not any actual video. But supposedly... He, the guy came and took the money out of the register and wasn't even confronted. And then for whatever reason, the guy came back and then, and then killed him. Hmm. So, so, so yeah. I, I think, I think what you would, you would probably want to clarify there is you're not like, you're not removing grief from the family or just the unlucky, you know, wrong spot at the wrong time again for the family other than the fact that the new york times article takes tremendous liberties with the association here absolutely you know you're you're absolutely right it's it's the media's for child not the family by no means and i believe and, and the point that i would like to make on this particular one is if you remove the daughters from being at parkland when the shooting happened would this would this article be in the new york times oh it absolutely and, and, wouldn't yeah yeah I think one of the things that we need to remember, though, is that statistically speaking, 99.9% of the people uh, in this country will never see a violent act uh, that either of these people uh, encountered. So understandably, several things happen in your life, Mark, because of your military service and places you've lived and obviously you know what happened to your sister-in-law. Um, but you are an outlier. The majority of people out there will never experience any of those things. And the fact that this family has experienced things like this twice makes them statistically uncommon. Yours is even more uncommon, but they are statistically uncommon among the masses to where they're experiencing things that most people will never even, they read about in the news, but it never affects them directly. I wonder, that's a good, really good point, um, just the uncommonality of it too, Kenny, percentages-wise. Uh, how often do we think, you know, we have you guys, you guys have probably, like I said, it's been a long time since I've been on the show, but Florida Man, you know, is always... Uh, popping up in the news, and and I also I also feel like just as frequently as Florida man is around is Broward County Sheriff's Office. Like we, mm. I I feel like when Florida's in the headline, I could roll the dice, and it would like four out of six be something Broward County related. It just, it just I I feel I, if someone said what's the first county you could think of in Florida, it would be Broward County every single time. Oh, absolutely. I, and I, <laughs> Maybe that's it. Just I'm clued in, and that's the only one that I hear. Uh, just interesting, even even with the photos, you know, uh, Broward County Sheriff's Office released these images of the person suspected of the robbery and killing of Ayu Bali. Just I don't know, interesting to me. Broward County for the win again. Yeah, always. Well, speaking of which, Florida man won't be charged in deadly parking space dispute due to stand your ground laws. So, okay. yeah, there he is. <laughs> what well, you're skipping ahead, but there he is. I, I am skipping ahead. I mean, it was timely, so I jumped. Um, yeah, yeah, it's good. 
But that being said, I mean, obviously, so this guy gets into a dispute with a woman who's parked in a handicapped, uh, you know, disabled spot, doesn't have a sticker or placard uh, to allow her to park there. So gets into a, stu- a dispute with her. Her boyfriend walks out of the uh, establishment that's right next door, knocks this guy to the ground. The guy draws his gun and fires. Um, I don't know. I've got my thoughts, but I want to hear what you guys have to say. Mark, what are your thoughts? So I watched the video on this, and um, I got two different takes on this. I got two different perspectives. Number one, this individual that came out of the convenience store that was uh, driving the vehicle or a passenger in the vehicle that was parking in the disabled or handicapped space was a younger, more fit individual that walked up on a Uh, another individual who is older and not as in shape. So the very first thing that popped in my head was the disparity of force, right? So you have a a taller, bulkier guy who runs up and and walks walks up, not runs, and shoves this guy to the ground very violently. So the The other individual who had the gun felt that he was threatened in that spot, that he knew that he wasn't going to uh, prevail in a fist fight, so he drew his weapon. Now, if you watch the video, the, the guy who did the pushing backs up and then kind of takes a step forward and then backs up again because he sees the gun, and that's when he gets shot right in the chest. Um, in my perspective, if Obviously, if I'm playing Monday morning quarterback here, if I'm the guy that got shoved and I make that decision to draw my pistol, I'm not pulling the trigger until that person, you know, then lunges at me uh, and commits. Right. In this situation, he was kind of backing up. It looked like he was like, okay, all right, whatever. He didn't have his hands up, but he was definitely backing away. So I don't think that this is a very good shoot. Uh, And if, if anything, you know, there's always the civil side of things that he could be sued for wrongful death. Um, I'd be interested to see how that goes, but that's kind of how some of my training has kind of taught me to deal with those types of situations. Uh, I mean, the biggest thing would have been to diffuse the situation instead of walking out there and pushing the dude down to the ground. It was a pretty violent push too. So that's my take on it. Yeah, it was indeed. But uh, anyway, Evs, I'm curious to hear what you have to say. Sorry, I was muted. The post just completely out of control. Hold on. Coco, (laughs) calm down. She's got a ribeye bone, like losing her mind. Um, So just completely out of control. If if you, the the show notes are available to a listener. uh, If you go to this, after it describes the initial altercation and then about midway down and there's this paragraph um, that is completely unnecessary. Oh yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and my, and my l- listen, my, my take, I, I would side with Mark on this, just reading body language. Wasn't there, didn't witness it. Um, but going, Oh, it, it doesn't, it's not escalating. Like it looks like, it, it feels like more of a retaliation than than a, a move towards self defense. Um, but here, listen to this paragraph. Um, and by the way, if you're listening and you've never seen me, I'm white. Okay, uh, that's when McLaughlin, who is black, exited the store and approached Dredjka, shoving him violently to the ground with both hands. Surveillance video shows while still on the ground. Dredjka, who is white, then pulled out a gun and shot McLaughlin, firing a single round that struck him in the chest, deputy said. Now, what is that paragraph intended to do outside of convey information as to what actually happened? Pure identity politics. Well, thousand percent. That, that is... It is, it's profiling in the wrong direction for the purpose of furthering stereotypes. There, there is, that says, that paragraph says everything but what it actually says. And that is the New York Post. And what? That is the New York Post. And then that is the New York Post. But, but like the video's there, the evidence is there. Okay. It happened. Um, whatever, whatever, you know, 
whatever will continue to happen with the circumstances, we don't know. Uh, but the the way that this is shared, uh, and then and then moves immediately from that paragraph to talk about the children who were left uh, behind as a result of the altercation um, and the subsequent death is super tough. Uh, just hard as can be. I mean, you can't like you, you just. If you don't know, especially if you don't know the person, if there's if there's a ver- verbal argument, keep it verbal. Like just keep your hands off of people. It doesn't need to go to that. You don't know how somebody's going to respond. This is a perfect example of that. Um, and just, I'm surprised. I I was surprised that he shot. I, I expected him to see him pull the gun and then not fire any shots to, to, to keep him from advancing. And I think that's what, that's what McLaughlin, the guy who shoved him down. I think that's probably what he felt too. I think he felt like I've been, I'm being drawn on. I'm, I'm going to chill. Uh, but that, that's, that's not how it ended. Yeah. Well, also in the relating story, there's um, apparently other people have had altercations with this uh, gentleman for the same reason for parking in that disabled space. And there was another, um, person of black descent who said that uh dredgka uh, threatened to shoot him for parking in that space Mm -hmm. so this could just be somebody embellishing what actually happened or it could be that this guy has just kind of been dying to shoot somebody i mean we don't know but it's it's a little bit damning as people are coming out saying they've had altercations with this guy in the past so it sounds like he's a, a bit of a hothead who takes matters into his own hands when he shouldn't and it's uh a pretty Russian name. Yeah, yeah. So I'm surprised they didn't throw the immigrant status in there as well. But uh, uh, the other thing I would say is, if you watch the video after he pulls that trigger and McLaughlin walks away, he just sits there. He, he the the shooter just just sits on the ground. He fumbles around a little bit, and it's a, it's a good thirty forty five seconds of him just sitting there. And I'm pretty sure it was a what the heck did I just do type of situation until he finally stood up and I believe flagged someone down. Uh, it looked like he was motioning for someone to come near him, but uh, I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, personally, I think he overstepped his bounds. Um, I understand the stand your ground laws in Florida protect him, but the way I saw it, uh, McLaughlin was no longer a threat. He was initially a threat, and then he backed off. He knocked him on his butt, and he was like, all right, that's pretty much it. Um, and Dredgka drew his gun. Obviously, the threat had ended at that point. He did not advance on him. He did not make any uh, furtive movements towards him whatsoever, but he still chose to fire. I think that that was out of bounds, but again, I wasn't there. I only see video. I don't know what was said in the time, you know, be- the exchange between them. Um, you know, the guy may have said, I'm going to kill you. And uh, even though he didn't advance, he may have threatened him. Um, we don't know because we're only getting part of the story and we weren't there. We weren't in his head. So it, it's difficult to say. I'm not going to pass judgment on the guy. I'm just going to say based on what I saw, I would have handled it differently. But not being in his shoes, I can't say 100 percent that I would have done. You know, I wouldn't have done the same thing. So anyway, there's a, you know, a lot of protesters now that are calling for an arrest. Um, they don't think it's right. And it's tough to say. I mean, it's a, uh, it's a judgment call in the end. you got to follow what the law says. And I guess in Florida, the law says he was uh, in the right. So they got to stick with what, whatever um, has uh, been ratified by, by uh, their legislature. Well, my question would be is how much different would this situation would have been if Dredgka, uh, if I pronounce the guy's name right, would have been a woman. Would we have the same argument right now? Yeah, uh, pro- probably not. I mean, just the, what the question implies, we just we wouldn't because of uh, how overmatched it would have been considered, or or yep. uh, how disrespectful it would have been considered. Or I mean, he was de- I mean, stature even, regardless of twenty years difference in age, almost stature wise. Uh, definitely didn't hold a candle to him, even if they were the same age. 
Yeah, and and, that, and that's the point. That's the critical key that I have to this. Uh, why I would even begin to lean into believing that this was a viable shoot. Uh, I, I don't. The preponderance of evidence that I see is fifty one percent no. But again, it's that disparity in stature, as you're saying, that really kind of. Uh, Hey, Florida's got that for a reason, you know. Yeah, disparity. Yeah, I didn't say disparity in stature because I don't use words that big, but uh, <laughs> I I appreciate the hat tip towards my description. <laughs> yeah, disparity of force is disparity of force. Whether it be you know someone who is uh, more diminutive in stature, someone who is older and a bit more feeble, um, or someone who is just generally less. Um, well, shall we say muscular or strong because of, of, you know, body makeup, a female or someone who is maybe more feminine in their build. Um, all of those things may be true, but the way that I saw it, the threat had ended. And that's the, you know, my big thing there is that th- the fact that the threat had ended, he wasn't really a threat to him anymore, but yet he chose to shoot. So again, I wasn't there. I can't say I can only ba- judge based on what I saw, but, uh, that being said, let's move on to the next story. Minnesota, there was a corrections officer that was killed by an inmate with a hammer. So, you know, by all rationalizations, prisons should be the safest place for uh, people to be because there are no weapons. Um, People are confined. They're locked up. They're under the care of people with arms, um, different weapons and ways of restraining people and and keeping them under control. And yet this this, uh, corrections officer was beat to death with a hammer inside of a prison while others just looked on. Um, just a horrible situation. Evs, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, everything is a weapon if it's uh, used as such. But, um, I mean, they try to, I mean, this is an example of an environment where you try to limit the potential of a weapon getting in the wrong hands, like something that's labeled as a weapon, right? Um, but these officers are are armed with pepper spray and a radio. Like that's what they have. Um, supposedly, this was the first fatal attack uh, that happened inside this specific facility where an inmate actually killed uh, one of the corrections officers. So, um, total s- sad story. Sounded like an awesome guy, kind hearted guy. Um, even even treated uh, treated the inmates well. Um, for what it sounds like, but, uh, just, a you know, completely unfair end to his time there. Totally agree, Mark. So it's interesting that they would allow inmates to be around this type of, these types of, um, tools, um, regardless of how you look at it, but the, the, it's really ironic because, <clears throat> I honestly, I didn't read through the article, but <laughs> while I'm at work, I usually have YouTube or a podcast run, uh, running in the background so I can just have something to listen to other than the clicking of my keyboard. And I just so happened to get into Southern Justice. I don't know if you guys have ever watched this show, uh, but <laughs> the episode that I was watching was talking about the um the prisons in these two counties in Eastern Tennessee and Western North Carolina and the individuals that are allowed to have uh, jobs, the privilege to have jobs cannot have any type of violent charges against them. So it's going to be your individuals that uh, have DUIs or, um, you know, drug charges or something to that effect. It can't be any type of domestic violence. It can't be any type of, you know, murder or anything like that. So to see that they would have allowed someone who was serving time for a 2002 murder of his roommate, um, the access to tools um, surprises me. So, and I'm pretty sure the, 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 um, the uh, prison will probably review those policies, but I just, uh, th- this is something new to me, but at the same time, it seems common sense that you wouldn't put a murderer with blunt objects that could maim or kill somebody. A lot of these prisons, they have a different programs for, pr- for prisoners. Um, I know, I don't know if you guys know it or not. I was a police officer in California for seven years. There is actually a prisoner's bill of rights in California where the prisoners have more rights than 
um, any of their victims ever had. Um, just the things that they are allowed to do and have is ridiculous. Um, but that being said, some of these uh, prisons, they have their you know, work programs where hopefully upon release, these people will have some type of skill where they can go get a job and be a productive member of society again. So the whole rehabilitation thing, I think, is a farce because how do you turn somebody who has never been a productive member of society back into a productive member of society? That's saying I want to turn my dog back into a tree. Um, it just doesn't work. So I think it's a fallacy, but these are the liberal policies that go on. Just uh, I think it was last week or the week before we had a story where there was a woman who woke up to a man um, with his hand down her pants as she you know, was in bed with her children. This was a gentleman who, well, gentleman, a person who was convicted of murder just four years prior, but here he is out in the world again, just got released and he's out committing crimes once again. Goes back to, you can't rehabilitate people. You can't legislate morality. You can't say, okay, you're going to do good things now because we said so. And that's the way it goes. It just doesn't work. These are bad people. They're bad to the core. Typically some of them may be able to be saved, but the majority of them they're gone and there's nothing we can do. We just need to lock them up and throw away the key. And put them on hard labor. Make prison a difficult place to be, a place that they don't want to go back to so that maybe they'll change their ways. But as long as they're there with their friends and going to, you know, college for criminals, they're going to continue, you know, continue doing the same things. And that's one of the comments that was made in that uh, episode of Southern Justice that I watched was that, you know, these guys are in prison and most of the time they just end up going back to prison because uh, they're hamstringed when they get out. There's no, there's no rehabilitation because they already have a felony on their record. They're not going to find a decent job to hold anything down. Uh, most of the time they don't get the help that they need with any type of substance of abu- substance abuse while they're in prison. So they get out. Um, they, they probably enjoy freedom for a little bit. They have some good times, you know, uh, and then realize, Oh crap! I can't find a job. I need money to support my alcoholism or uh, to find some more Xanax or whatever the case may be. They go commit a crime. They rob somebody. They get caught up. They go back and they're like, "Oh, eh, I have three hots and a cot for me." I mean, I know that's not everybody, but uh, that's that's one of the comments that was made in that episode that was pretty striking. I, uh, <laughs> Mark, I love you said alcohol and Xanax like that was. <laughs> That's, 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 the only your, drugs. that's the only drugs out there, right? Yeah, no, it's amazing because I, I'm like I've been seeing Demi Lovato headlines, and I'm like, there's meth everywhere. My fiance is a social worker, so the heroin stories I get on a daily basis are incredible. And, and you, <laughs> you with the alcohol and Xanax, which I'm sure is an amazing combination, but um, just wasn't caught me off guard. It caught me off guard. It was awesome. All right, moving on. So that wraps up uh, our less than positive news. Just want to remind you guys, don't forget to visit our sponsors, Patriot Patch Co. Uh, If you are into patches, T-shirts, cleaning mats, um, stickers, whatever it is, they've got something for you. Um, Taxation is theft. This is one of their shirts. Um, So, uh, you know, we they just do a bunch of great stuff. I've got a patch board over there that's full that uh, now I need to make another one to you know, for the patch that's coming in in a few days here, I got to go ahead and make some some room to put start putting some more patches on. But uh, just a great sponsor of the show. We can't thank them enough for all they do. Patriot Patch Go uh, for all your patch needs. Moving into the I'm Offended section, we have a Florida congressional candidate who wants to uh, he wants a full ban on weapons of war. Uh, and at the same time, he's doubling down because he's investing in ammo companies. I know there's been a lot of speculation in the past about politicians possibly doing these things to create a scare so that they can turn around and make money. And it looks like this particular con- uh, congressional candidate is doing that. Um, I don't know. The evidence is a little overwhelming. Mark, what do you think? Well, I don't know if he's going to be doing it for very long now that uh, it's been plastered all over media. And if hopefully this will get picked up and kind of shared and, and just make him look like a, a buffoon. But uh, yeah, it seems pretty, perfectly logical to me that you would create uh, an environment for you to profit in. Um, the, the thing that really, really bugs me um, about uh, what the article says is they use the term weapons of war. Um, well, or, or 
or is that the is that the new term that we're going to use for firearms? Or are we still talking about swords and bows and arrows and uh, slings? Because those were weapons of war at one point in time, right? Uh, but then again, didn't we just have a lawsuit uh, between an individual and the state uh, the, the state department where the DOJ came out and said? The AR-15 is not a weapon of the war, so we need to figure out our terms and get them correct before we start plastering these stupid articles out there. Um, you know, part of me is like, hey, David, uh, good job on you for um, creating an environment for you to, prof- uh, to profit. But you know what? Could you not do it with the things that I love in firearms? <laughs> could you do it like with, I don't know, the pharmaceutical market? You know, I'm pretty sure you could make a lot of money out of that, so. It's ridiculous. I, it shows if anybody doubts the fact that politicians uh, are so easy to figure out if you just follow the money, that both includes the way that they vote and the things that they stand for. Um, this is a perfect example of that. The other thing I would say is it's a really good reminder for the gun community of uh, two things. One, probably how divided we are. How many people still feel like this? I, I'm into these guns and they're okay because they're used for X, Y, Z. Okay, so there's that uh, there's that personal glorification uh, and holier than thou attitude uh, because they only use guns for this and it's socially acceptable and whatever. The other thing is that. There, there are folks who will come flat out and say, I'm not against guns. I'm not against ammo. But then, is, even as this article says, hypocritically go in the opposite direction and talk about uh, the, the guns that they are okay with and that they aren't okay with. Um, so there's still a need for education out there uh, in terms of, what should be allowed, what the Second Amendment represents. I think I think that we have a tendency to forget once we get to a place in our own mind and our own lives where we understand completely that we take a step back and say, uh, this is uh, this is what it is, and everyone needs to know this. And then we forget to bring people along, or we forget to take somebody to the range who's only used completely non-threatening firearms uh, to hunt with or to plink around with, and take them and show them your your Mark eighteen uh, commando clone, uh, you know, with your SOCOM suppressor on the end, and show them how freaking radical it is and give them an opportunity to shoot it and go, Oh, uh, I have to pull the trigger every time I want a round to come out of it. Uh, and, and to understand that this is, it looks like it, but it isn't it. It's like somebody trying to tell me that their V six challenger is almost comparable to a scat pack or a shaker or a Hellcat challenger or something like that. No, it's an imposter. It looks like it, but it will not do what the other one will do. Oh, Look absolutely. at the Ebbs coming out with the with the Hellcat. <laughs> Someday, baby. Someday. Oh, indeed. You know, there's a lot of posers out there, regardless of uh, you know what it is. And, and like you know, we've been saying that time and time again. It seems like uh, some of these people are they know that they're driving the firearm industry. Um, to record sales so they have to be doubling down on it and now we've got evidence that somebody actually is so you know i think if uh we're able to go ahead and uh track some of these investments uh we we may find that there are a lot of other politicians that have done the same and have reaped quite a hefty reward off of their scare tactics and their fear mongering as they go ahead and say that they're going to take everything away from us so anyway that wraps up our uh, um offended section before we move on to the full auto news section, I just want to thank our other sponsor of the show, Manicore Arms. Manicore Arms, they make a lot of uh, different accessories for the AK, the AR-15, the Brand, the Scorpion, the Steyr Aug, the Tavor. Uh, they have different field gear now that uh, they introduced at NRA. Um, they've just got a number of different parts. So if you're looking for accessories for any of those weapons, um, definitely check out Manicore Arms. 
It is, you know, they support the, um, us and other shows on the network. Definitely a, a great group of people there. Um, Sven and Kristen, just awesome people, and we can't thank them enough for all they do. So please f- give them a, a visit and definitely buy a thing or two from them. It really helps uh, them and it helps us. So don't forget, uh, use the code TWD10, save 10% off your purchase, and get some cool stuff for those firearms. So moving on into the full auto news segment. Mark, what was your story? Oh my goodness! I am so uh, I am so happy to see this story because I love Chick Fil A. Uh, baby born at Chick Fil A receives free meals for life and job offer, which is totally awesome. We've got one here in town, and I can't eat there enough. Uh, the only thing that I really dislike about Chick Fil A is the fact that uh, they're not open on Sundays. Uh, good for them, but uh, the story is basically a uh, baby girl was born in Texas Chick Fil A location hmm. on Tuesday. Uh, and, and that baby is going to receive free meals for life from the fast food chain and ha- has a guaranteed job when she's old enough. If I knew that this was the way to get my daughter a job, I would have made sure that my wife uh, was in a Chick-fil-A when my daughter was born. <laughs> but uh, I really like this article that, uh, that they referred to the the – the child as a little nugget uh, couldn't wait for <laughs> her parents to get to the hospital. Fallon and Robert Griffin were on their way there and had stopped at a closed Chick-fil-A location to use the bathroom. <laughs> so, uh, you know, good on you guys. I-, I love to see these types of uh, good news stories. And, and to-, to be frankly honest with you, I really like the fact that uh, Chick-fil-A would even offer something like this. It just shows the type of uh, company that they are, the, th- the the type of company that not only cherishes their patrons, but also really looks out for their employees as well. So good on you, Chick-fil-A. And um, I probably need to get to know the Griffins a little bit better. <laughs> no doubt. Yeah, I, I'm, su- I'm surprised. Uh, no hat tip towards the mom at all, though. You know, the, the kid, the kid doesn't have any control over where she's born. Um, and so great mascot, but wow, mom, way to go. Uh, you know, just thought she was going to the bathroom and gives birth at a Chick-fil-A. And for, hopefully they gave free meals to everyone there because of how, uh, potentially disturbing or traumatic that was while you're trying to eat too. So yeah, no doubt. Well, I mean, they're going to have a spokesperson for life now and they'll be like, this, this child was raised on Chick-fil-A. Right. <laughs> Well, the one thing that I'm bothered by this article is the fact that they stopped at a closed Chick-fil-A location. So I, I would say just if if there are any um, fathers-to-be out there or um, any, you know, women out there that are pregnant, just, you know, kind of time your delivery around a Chick-fil-A location and you probably could follow up on this one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, but the fact they were closed and they opened up to let her in to use the restroom, I mean, that could have been a ploy, but they're just good, genuine people typically at Chick-fil-A and very trusting. So, I mean, it it speaks volumes to the types of people that um, operate those doors. It does. It does. Mm -hmm. So, Ebs, what was your story? Oh, boy. Everybody's everybody's, going to put on their tinfoil caps and uh, go back to World Cup, talk about some poverty ball here for just a minute. Uh, but apparently this was uh, this was last week. Uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin gave a gift of a soccer ball to President Donald Trump, and a uh, whole bunch of people are freaking out uh, because they're saying they need to check the soccer ball for listening devices and never allow it in the White House. Um, but ironically, this specific Adidas soccer ball uh, apparently has a chip in it anyway that allows fans to access player videos, uh, competitions, other content by bringing their mobile devices close to the ball. So. It's app driven and uh, proximity based, uh, but this is a hundred and sixty five dollar soccer ball. So great, uh, great use of funds there, and the picture is fantastic. You can see uh, P- 
Putin smiling smugly and Trump saying something about himself probably while he receives the soccer ball. <laughs> and uh, you can <laughs> – but the – so then – but anyway, they tried to ad- interview Adidas. Uh, they go into – they're asking uh, Press Secretary Sarah Sanders about, <laughs> about information about the soccer ball. And she's like, no, we're – not the, we're not worried about soccer ball. Security has happened. There aren't going to be anything more done for this. Uh, and uh, when they asked the Russian embassy uh, what they thought, they said, what they don't know can't hurt them. <laughs> so uh, apparently now Trump has a $165 Adidas soccer ball that he can watch videos on with his app. So I just got to ask you, Evs, how do you think that the transfer took place? What do you think uh, Putin said to him as he was handing him this ball? Uh, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm looking at the ball itself, and it kind of has funny shapes on uh, Huter's bowl. Take it or leave it, but uh, he's special bowl. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> ball is good. There's nothing in it. Nothing to be suspicious about. Nice. Russian. So, yeah. uh, I don't. I don't. Putin doesn't say a whole lot, does he? Uh, you kind of, kind of wish he would say more. I kind of wish he would say more. Uh, but yeah, who knows? Just the things. Uh, the things we'll get excited about. Let's. It, they have to have more. The Russians have to have more creativity. If if we wanted to spy on you, we would not use silly bull. Indeed, so. they'll just rig an election. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, have you you guys see the video of what happened right after Putin gave the president the ball and how he tossed it over to Ivanka? Did you guys see that? <laughs> it, it was like first, it was like it was the the lamest toss ever, right? He, he had both hands on it, and it was just kind of a. It looked like uh, uh, oh, what's that old guy from um, the nuclear plant? owner for the Simpsons. What's that guy's name? Oh, Mr. Montgomery or <laughs> McGo- Montgomery Burns. Yeah. Burns. Yeah. yeah. It's like, he it was like, eh, when he tossed it and then it just like bounced and rolled to a vodka. It was hilarious. <laughs> but the, the other thing is, uh, it, everybody who doesn't like Trump anyway, not that I'm a big fan of his, but anyone who doesn't like Trump already knows that, He's in Putin's back pocket. So why would he need to put a chip in there to spy on him anyway? You just pick up the phone and say, "Hey, I need I need you to tell me some some good news." And and Trump would just run his mouth and give off, you know, secrets to the the secret freaking nuclear codes or something like that and then talk about probably talk about the size of his wiener and or his hands. I mean, sorry, yeah, that's what I meant, hands. Anyway, it is funny uh the exchange, you know, uh Trump makes it typically awkward as usual, but Putin does say a few words before it hands it, hands it to him, and it's like, here is a soccer ball from Russia. He has a vodka and potato with sight. Enjoy. <laughs> and then Trump holds it up. Here it is. Here's the soccer ball. Yeah. And he pats it. He pats it like it's a pet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just so many shenanigans. Oh, yeah, no it, doubt. Is, it is just the most awkward meeting ever. Indeed. All right. Well, guys, can't thank you enough. Great stuff tonight. Um, just great having both of you back. Um, Mark, where can people find you? Oh, they can find me on the YouTubes at Fit and Fire. That's Fit apostrophe in fire or just all smash it all together you can find me one way or the other i have a very good looking face so find the good looking guy and uh i'm just kidding uh you you can also find me on facebook as well fit and fire and instagram fit and fire seven eight i'm on the twitters but i don't really don't use it but uh anyway that's where you can find me i appreciate all the support and all those people who are supporting the channel thank you so much no thank you for being here ebbs it's been forever man what have you been up to uh, you know what? Stepped away a couple years ago from the uh, the gun media world, and it was a great entry to it. Met a lot of awesome people and and uh, good start to relationships there. And um, did a little bit with uh, John Patton at the Gun Collective on the way out of the media side of things. And then just uh, moved over to focusing on the retail side uh, with my dad. We started a company uh, 
nine years ago called uh, House of Arms, and uh, it's an online gun shop. Basically, we focus on Thompson Center Encore and Contender products, primarily single shot platforms. Uh, we've gotten into some barrel development, stocks, accessories, basically uh, just t- trying to make a creative take on a solid platform. It's been around for a, quite a while, uh, simple, reliable, and uh, easy to tweak. So I spent a lot of time working on triggers. Um, this year so far, I've done over 150 already. And uh, so I spent a lot of time in, in frames and uh, putting together some funky new ideas for, for guns uh, that folks haven't seen before. So uh, that's our website too, House of Arms with H A U S of Arms.com. And uh, booted up Instagram for it too. Uh, previously from my, my old media account. So that's at House of Arms. And uh, just putting up content, talking about what we're doing, trying to uh, spread love with with uh, something that's a little bit off the beaten path in terms of popular guns. Perfect. Well, yeah, definitely. I've looked at a few of those, and uh, I need to get some extra cash in my pocket so I could pick up some because they definitely look like they're a fun platform. Yeah, it's good stuff. Appreciate it, man. Oh, no problem. Thank you. It's been great having you back. Hopefully you join us again soon. Yep, glad to do it. Perfect. Well, with that, if you enjoyed the show, please leave your feedback by commenting at the bottom of this YouTube video or bottom of the show notes. Um, leave us a review in iTunes. Help the show by uh, visiting our Amazon affiliate link, our sponsors, Patriot Patch Co. and Manicore Arms, or you can uh, pledge at firearmsradio.tv slash pledge. This Week in Guns is produced by me. I know uh, you guys are a little bit you know, taken aback this week because of the fact that uh, you got me instead of Sean. Sean is out with... Um, uh brown Ls on their tour that they're doing so he's out in other parts of the country right now and having some fun and shenanigans with them but with that being said this week in guns is a production of the firearms radio network and we thank you guys for joining us those of the individual co-host and do not reflect the official policy or position of the firearms radio network and or their employers viewer discretion is advised this is especially true on our live shows broadcast for shooters hunters and gun enthusiasts Sorry, that was the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs>